Um, I know everybody has a lot of stuff going on right now, so let's uh, go ahead and get this over with. Eric Samuels is on the line, and he is just going to briefly talk to you about some differences to the point in time survey this year. And he's gonna tell you all about that. And just as an FYI, I have everyone muted right now because there are so many people on that it would just be really bad feedback. So if you have a question, you can go ahead and put, put it into the question box and then I will get to that. And I'll, if it's okay with you, just go ahead and mention what the question is to everyone in case somebody else uh, is, has the same question. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Eric. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And everyone, thank you to the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care Point in Time Count Coordination Webinar. This is the first webinar to the entire Continuum of Care this year. And before Lindsay got, got started, I wanted to go over a few things with everyone because many of you will notice differences with this year's survey instrument. There are some of you who are attending who will be administering the survey for the first time. Um, the, the folks in Beaumont will be doing this for the first time with the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care, and there are probably others. And for those of you who are first-timers, you may look at some of the questions and you may ask yourself, why are they asking that question? And or why are they asking that question in that way? And um, there are reasons for that, and I'll get to that in a second. And then if you're a, uh, an experienced point-in-time administrator for the balance of state, you will also notice differences from years past. And you may ask yourself, why are the questions slightly different than they were last year or the year before or even five years ago? And I want to explain that as well. So... In the past, um, we have had a pretty consistent survey. One of the things that has always remained consistent with our survey is that we have adhered to HUD's requirements in terms of what questions we ask. That still, that remains the same. We uh, are still asking the questions that HUD requires. And for those of you who are new to our process, you may ask yourself, well, why are they asking about gender identity and ethnicity and stuff like that? And those questions, those are some of the questions that are required by HUD. And the way that we ask them, that it's also required by HUD. For those of you who've been around for a long time, you are used to that. But those of you who are veterans that will notice that there are a lot of questions that are dedicated to youth this year. And some of the questions that we've had in years past are taken out in place of those youth questions. And the reason that we have a greater emphasis on the youth questions this year is because we are working with the Texas Network of Youth Services and Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs to fulfill the requirements under House Bill 679, which was passed in the uh, Texas uh, legislative session, the last le legislative session, the 84th legislative session. So this year you will notice some changes to our questions and there's more of a youth slant uh, to the questions because of this emphasis. Now I want to say that while we will always ask the questions that HUD requires we ask, we will not always ask the questions about youth. Next year we'll most likely um, resume uh, with the questions that we have asked in the past because we do like to see that consistency and we like to track the historical data um, that we have tracked for so many years. So this year things are a little different and it's because uh, of that, that youth count emphasis. And then for those of you who are new, um, just know that there's a reason the questions are asked the way that they are. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say with that. Uh, of course, we welcome your questions. Type them in, as Lindsay said. And uh, Lindsay will be available after this call uh, going forward to provide guidance to you. And I am going to...
fade away in the background, but I'll be here if, if anyone needs me. Okay. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. Um, so what Eric just said, keep that in mind. Tuck it away for when the PowerPoint is over, and then we'll go ahead and go over the survey together. And that's a, that's a time where I, I would assume that a lot of the questions will be asked. So um, again, there are plenty of you who are veterans at this, but we've got a handful who are new or um, who, uh, who, who will be doing this for the first time in their community, even though the communities participated. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Possibly. There we go. So what is this? It's a point in time survey, and it means that all the data is collected within a 24 hour period. HUD has mandated that all counts and surveys for COC planning and grants will be conducted using the point in time method. Now, THN is asking the balance of state regions, and that's you all, to begin the count survey at a time early enough for each community to comprehensively canvas their area. Now, this might mean that you start at midnight. It depends. It might mean that you start at four o'clock in the morning, at six o'clock in the morning. You really need to tailor it to your specific community, okay? There really isn't a one size fits all time period for this, other than it need, needing to be on that day. So why do we do this? Well, it's a requirement. HUD requires this to be done. However, it's more than a requirement. This is what the point in time does for us. It gives us an accurate count and your community will have a baseline um, going forward with goals. And maybe you've got more than these five goals right here, but these are really good goals to have. So entering, ending veteran homelessness, reducing your chronic homelessness, reducing family homelessness, the length of time a person or a family spends in homelessness, and then eliminating returns to homelessness. And hopefully we can eliminate um, the entry to homelessness. So that it's more than a requirement. It's going to help us as a COC evaluate the progress that we has, we've made, and then it's gonna help you as a community and your local homeless coalition uh, track the progress that you've made as well um, on ending and reducing homelessness. And then we also have reliable data for any local stakeholders or funders or when your congressperson calls us and says, hey, we are looking for data for this particular area, we're able to pull that for them. And um, this happens. So please don't think that that doesn't happen. It, it does. Um, so it is fantastic. It's great. Um, it, it's, it's just a really fun, interesting snapshot for, for your community. Now, who do, we, who do we survey and who do we count? We count the sheltered homeless and the unsheltered homeless. So let's talk about who those people are. The sheltered homeless, these are adults, children, and youth residing in shelters and transitional housing facilities. This includes domestic violence shelters, residential programs for runaway homeless youth, um, and those staying in a hotel or motel that's been paid, paid with by a voucher from an agency. Okay, so those are the sheltered homeless. And then obviously, uh, hopefully everyone understands the, um, the unsheltered homeless, adult children, youth sleeping in places not meant for human habitation. So we're talking about your parks, tent cities, abandoned buildings, cars, um, literally on the streets. So those are your unsheltered homeless. So if you give me one second, someone has a question. Okay, um, someone is indicating that uh, the unsheltered count is not always required. Uh, HUD requires an unsheltered count every other year, um, but the Texas um, Balance of State, COC, we do our unsheltered count every year. Um, so we are really consistent, we have good numbers, and then when we report back to HUD, we're able to report year to year comparison instead of every other year comparisons. So. Okay, so let me put that question back. Okay, now here's here's one that everyone is is really uh, every year. 
the, this is the big question. What part of the count is actually submitted to HUD? And it's great. What we do is we get all of your surveys, we get all your answers, and then we get the folks, the families, the individuals, all of those people staying in emergency shelter, transitional shelters, places not meant for habitation, the VA domiciliaries, and hotel motels paid with um, by, uh, by a voucher. We take all of those people and those are the ones that we work with that we send to HUD. That's who HUD considers to be homeless. Now, you might have a, a different opinion. I might have a different opinion, but this, these are the people who HUD considers to be homeless. So once we get those people out of all of the data that you sent us, then that's what we work with. Um, a lot of times, uh, communities will want to see everybody, and and I'm more than happy to do that for you and send a report. You know, because not not everyone that you talk to on the night of the count is going to be homeless, and that's okay. Um, just because somebody is at a soup kitchen it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have a roof over their head, right? Some people just need a little extra assistance eating. So, um, but these are the people who are considered to be homeless by HUD. And somebody is asking, will you make the presentation available to us after the webinar? Indeed, it is being recorded and we will get that up on our website as soon as possible. I mean, and by I mean, maybe this afternoon, if not tomorrow morning, and then I'll send everyone an email out to let you know it's there because I know some people are, are gonna miss this. Okay. So continuing um, about what's submitted to HUD, we also have the demographic information for each member of the household. So we submit the age, the gender identity, the race, the ethnicity, the household type, and that means uh, a single individual or a household, you know, with one adult, with at least one adult and at least one child, or a household with only children, that's what that means their veteran status, and their disability status. Looks like we have one more question that says, is the sheltered homeless considered to be individuals living in an apartment whose rent is paid by a program? Um, no, uh, that sounds like permanent supportive housing or something, it, I don't know. Um, to the person who's sending that to me, Jason, go ahead and, and uh, send me an email about what that is. But no, these are the only people, emergency shelter, the transitional housing, literally on the streets, the VA domiciliary, and then the uh, vouchers for the hotel and motel. Okay. So where are we going? Well, we're going to known locations. Now, they're not known locations to me because I don't live where you live, but these are going to be known locations to you, and you know where to go. So, first of all, you know all of the shelters in your area, okay, and they have to participate in this. Go ahead and let them know. They should already know about it now, and I'll be able to provide you with some flyers uh, if you'd like. That's always helpful just to kind of remind caseworkers and uh, and directors of shelters that this is coming up. And you also wanna use information from what we call key informants, um, which sounds very law and order, but it's basically, these are the folks who, who know where your homeless individuals are, are living. It, it, do they know where a tent city is? Yeah, they're gonna know that. Um, they're gonna know where maybe uh, some youth congregate and hang out. So, you want to talk to people who have experienced homelessness, people who are actually working out in the fields, maybe some uh, volunteers at St. Vincent de Paul, any other local churches, stuff like that. Um, even law enforcement. But we'll talk about this later, just as a quick note. You don't really want to take um, a, a police officer out with you on the night of the count, especially if they're in their uniform, okay? Uh, so just keep that in mind. But again, your key informants, your, your outreach workers, your librarians, librarians know a lot of stuff. They're, they're, they're geniuses. Um, and again, people who, uh, who have come out of homelessness. Um, so those are your known locations. Um, 
I'm gonna, so I'm getting a couple of questions here. Uh, if, if you two can hold off for a second, I will definitely get to those. Um, I just have two in a row and def I, yeah, I just need to read through those before I, before I answer. So where do we want to count? Well, you know where you want to count. What I suggest doing is taking a, taking a Google map of your area and you can do this you know, with um, paint or Photoshop, whatever, uh, and just making boxes. Say, okay, this is a particular volunteer team. They're going to go do these, uh, this area. And this volunteer team is going to go hit this area. So it needs to be organized. And people need to know where they're going. And they need to feel safe. And we'll, we're going to talk all about that. I just wanted you to see what... Uh, what a map looks like that is um, sectioned off to uh, for your volunteers. Um, what you want to do is you want to make this really easy for them to read and for them to understand. Okay, so something like this would be fantastic. So we are going to move now into talking about planning. How how do you do this? Now I'm looking at the list of people who are on here, and a lot of you are pros. At this, a lot of you are really good at this, actually, and I see, yeah, I'm seeing some, I'm seeing some good stock here. So, your local coalition is responsible for planning and conducting the survey. What you should start doing now is forming a survey committee because it's only the week before Thanksgiving, so surely you're not busy. Uh, go ahead and form your survey committee and. That, that committee right there is going to be responsible for the point in time coordination. But if you're on this, you are part of the committee or you are the committee. So congratulations. So THN, which pretty much means me, will provide technical assistance, the survey documents, and um, an instruction manual at the local level. So it, that the instruction manual is ready to go. I just need to hit spell check and I'll get that instruction manual out to you. It's basically for your volunteers. It includes a script and it also talks about how to be sensitive with particular questions that are on the survey. Um, so that will all be coming to you. You want to choose a headquarters. This is usually some a shelter. So or if you're lucky enough to to have a central location, that that's that's what you want. Just a place or a, a room where you can gather your volunteers, you can have materials and you can have snacks. I highly recommend providing snacks for your volunteers, especially if you are using college students. Pizza goes a long way with them. Um, and stuff with sugar. That's that's what college kids like. That's what I liked. Anyway, let's move on. So you want to choose your headquarters. You want to recruit your volunteers and plan your plan your volunteer training. So go ahead, start thinking about who you want. You probably already know who you want. Most of you, I'm looking at this list, and I know you've already started talking to folks and starting start, have started to get get people involved. And your survey teams, whatever you want to call them, buddy up, buddy system, survey teams, uh, they should be formed and assigned specific locations. So any case manager or any shelter employee should complete the surveys with their own clients. OK, so you have a college student who's a volunteer and they're at the Salvation Army. Yeah, they don't need to do this with the folks who are actually staying at the Salvation Army. Let them go do it um, at the food pantry or the soup kitchen, but the case managers should be doing it um, with the folks who are actually living in their shelter. And if you'd like, each agency really can be considered its own survey team, and that's fine too. Uh, stuff that you will need, clipboards, you want clipboards, uh, flashlights, depending on how early or how late you're going to go out. And then it's always really good to have incentives. So what does that mean? It means when you go up to someone and you say, hi, my name's Lindsay. I'm, you know, with XYZ and we'd like to talk to you today and uh, see if you would answer some questions. And, and I have 
some socks for you, or I have a poncho, or I have a hygiene kit. Another really good thing is dog food. If you can get one of your local pet stores to donate some dog food, they get samples. They get these little bitty bags, samples of dog food. Uh, it's great. Um, or any donations of fast food gift cards. That's always wonderful. Um, the thing with that is if somebody doesn't want to take the survey, that's okay, but don't say, well, you can't have the socks. Go ahead and give them whatever incentive you have. Um, you know, we don't want to be those people. So just say, okay, that's not a problem. If you don't want to take the survey, here you go, and, and just move along. So another big thing you want to do is you want to make plenty of copies of the survey prior to the 21st. You don't want to be running around crazy because you have a million things to do the night of the count or the day of the count, and then all of a sudden it, your copier decides to break that day, uh, which would totally happen in our office. So make plenty of copies, and the copies that I sent you, don't make copies of those. Uh, there have been some changes just within the past couple of hours with the wording. So when the final survey is ready, I'll let you know, and you can make copies of those. So we're gonna talk just a little bit more about planning. We want to advertise to any service agency, shelter locations, um, just so the employees and the, and the residents know that this is happening. Local media for volunteers, advocacy, awareness, this is great. So I know a lot of you have gotten, somebody's asking if we're going to have a mobile app. We will have a mobile app and that will be its own webinar. Um, I know a lot of you have gotten uh, a lot of media with your previous counts, and that's fantastic. That's what you want, because that not only brings awareness to what's going on in your community, it shows folks that, hey, this is happening, and you always have that one person who's on city council or, or the school board or something. We don't have any homeless people. Well, that's not true. So this is fantastic. It's also a really good way to get volunteers, not only for the point in time count, but for any future endeavors that you have. Um, it's really great. If you have a Facebook page, if you use Twitter, any other Instagram, any other social media, start advertising. It's really fantastic. And, um, and if you're working in any way with college students, ask them to advertise. They're really good at this. This is what they're this is what they're in school for. They're in school for Facebook and Twitter. Um, so photos, okay. There's another question about the app and I'll get to that. Let me, let me just finish up talking about the photos. Uh, we would love to see your pictures. We'd love to see that. Um, we'd love to put them on our Twitter, on our Facebook. The only problem with that is that you cannot take a picture of a respondent without their permission. And if you can get the permission, that's fantastic. We would love to see those photos and we'll provide you with a photo and a video release form. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that, but we will need to see the, the release form when you send in your pictures. So you can scan that in and email it to us. But again, take pictures. It, it would be good for your local homeless coalition or your community. It would be good for us as well. We, we would really like to see to see our, our advocacy in action. So uh, somebody is saying that HUD does not have a mobile app. That's right, they don't. But again, I think this is maybe our third year. We have our own mobile app that we're gonna be uh, sending out to you if anybody would like to use that. So if you are interested in using the mobile app, let me know and I'll put you on that list and, uh, and then we'll go from there, okay? Just going to talk uh, really quick about some rules of thumb. This is not going to be surprising to anybody, but be polite and respectful because you're representing yourself, your community, but you're also representing THN. If approaching vehicles from the front, I would suggest knocking and then taking a few steps back. But I also want to say use your own discretion. We do not and we really won't tolerate anybody putting themselves in a dangerous situation, okay? But if you think that it is okay 
and a person is sleeping in their vehicle or they're sitting in their vehicle and you can tell that this is where they are living, just uh, from the front, knock, take a few steps back. So here's another one, uh, this next one. So there, there is a likelihood that you're going to encounter people who are asleep. Uh, and we want you to use your best judgment as to whether or not to wake them up, okay? There are two schools of thought here. One, that yes, it would be great to wake them up because we would very much like to interview this person because clearly they, they are homeless, they are, they, they are sleeping, they are living on the street. We would like that information. But here's another thing. One, when a person is sleeping on the street and that's where they live, they probably don't get a lot of sleep. So interrupting their sleep might not be the best idea. Also, another reason not to disturb somebody is they, I want to just say, maybe they have some PTSD and you waking them up might really shake them. So use your best judgment, okay? And do it with a buddy, but use your best judgment. But I'm telling you, you will probably encounter some people who are asleep. Okay, so we are just going to talk really quick about body language. So I'm going to have two examples for you. Um, you know, there are types of body language we use when we're talking to people that we don't know and the body language we use when we're talking to our friends or family members. Um, your body language helps people become more comfortable with you um, or it can intimidate them, and that's what we don't want to do. So if we can make the, the people that we're interviewing, if we can make them feel comfortable sharing their stories with us, then we're going to get accurate data. We're going to get better data, and we're going to get more data, which is, which is what we want, and quite frankly, it's what we need. So now normally I would ask people, hey, is this good body language? or is this bad body language? But since there are so many of you on the webinar, I'm gonna go ahead and answer and say this is bad body language. We don't want anyone to feel as though we're standing over them. Um, so you can see the clipboard there. We don't wanna build a wall between us and the person we're interviewing. And so when you approach somebody, hold it, just hold it at your side. Don't hold it in front of you. So even if you're in the shelter, try and sit down with the person. Try and find a private room where you can talk as well, okay? So let's move on to uh, example number two. So this is a picture of good body language. The, the guy is knelt down next to the person he's interviewing, and you can tell that he's engaged. Um, this is what we want. This is how we're going to get good, accurate data. So just a couple of uh, more points on that. We, we want you to be safe. Don't do anything that makes you feel uncomfortable or puts you in danger. Be assertive. Um, definitely stay confident. And um, most people are actually going to want to take this interview. And it's not going to be this big imposition on them. So that's probably the most uh, shocking thing, I think, first timers will come to realize is that, yeah, people actually do want, want, want to do this. Uh, just be respectful and, and sensitive and, and stay engaged. It's really, it's really important to stay engaged because this person is essentially trusting you with their personal story. Um, okay. Now we get to start talking about the survey instrument and then we get to look at the actual survey itself. So you're going to ask, it says on here, survey administrators, but basically your volunteers, to use the introductory script provided in the training manual that I was talking about a few minutes ago. Now, what we don't want is we don't want the, this people, your volunteers, reading it word for word. That's going to sound really weird, and no one's going to want to take that survey then. So have them scan over it. You know, if they want to condense it, that, that's fine, but make sure they get the gist of it. And then... We want to use the survey instrument for every potential respondent. If they decline to take it, that's great. That's fine. Well, it's not great. It's fine. But we do have a box 
in, just as we have in previous years, it says individual does not wish to take the survey or the situation is too dangerous, and that's fine. So just go ahead and mark that, but keep it in your stack because we, we do want to know how many of those uh, you come across. So go ahead and keep that in your stack. So you want to ask your volunteers to look at the survey and become familiar with it before they head out. This is really important because they need to ask questions ahead of time because they're going to have questions. They, they will have questions. Um, so it's really important that they review it before they go out. And we have some questions on here, depending on how they are answered, contain instructions that will tell the volunteer, okay, skip over the next answer and then go to this one. So you really need to emphasize that during your training or during your review with your volunteers. Um, some examples, and we'll see this when we look at, uh, at the survey in a few minutes, the veteran status of somebody. Listen, if they're not a veteran, guess what? They don't need to answer what uh, tour of duty they've, they've uh, been involved in. So we'll need, really need to pay attention to that. Uh, one big one that I saw that I saw last year was a lot of people um, would say that they didn't have any disabilities, but then later on in the survey, they would say that they needed HIV AIDS treatment. And, and so those are two, they would contradict each other. So stuff like that, you need, your volunteers will need to um, pay attention to. And your volunteers should fill out the survey. The respondents are not to fill out the survey without an interview, okay? So your volunteers, the case managers, even in the shelter, you are the ones filling out the survey. Okay, data entry. Uh, all coalitions are gonna be responsible for, for entering the data on site. So, you know, you can do this. It's just a link on, on, uh, on the internet. And it's through SurveyMonkey, or of course, we're gonna have our mobile app available for you as well. We did this last year, and it's really fantastic, SurveyMonkey. We can set it up that the questions are in order, the uh, options are in order, just like it is on, on the paper survey itself, and you just answer. And the good thing about SurveyMonkey is if somebody answers a particular question and then the next set of questions don't apply to them, the survey monkey will just go ahead and skip all of that for you and go to the, the right question. So it's really, really easy. We've had a lot of good responses from the survey monkey, and I, I have a feeling those of you who are new are going to like it as well. So once you turn in your data, and this is a uh, first turn in, first reports given type of a thing. So uh, if you're the first one to turn in your data, I'm going to get right on your data and uh, and I'm going to get you your report as soon as possible. So it's re prepared by region and on a statewide basis. And the results all together, the balance of state, will usually talk about that um, before our annual conference, but it's going to be presented there as well. Okay, so... These are the things that it will be available to you. You're gonna have the survey in English and in Spanish. You're gonna have your volunteer instructions and a script. Um, if you need postcards to mail, we can get those for you. Um, and if you need flyers, you think you want flyers to go ahead and put up, which I highly suggest you do, uh, we'll provide those for you as well. And again, all of this stuff will be on our website. I will let you know as soon as it is all up there and also let you know when the survey is 100% final. I'm going to show my information really quick. So I think everybody here has my email address and my cell phone number, my office number are attached in my signature line in my email. Um, however, if you would like to text me, if that might be easier for you, if you're out on the road or you're out in the field, uh, go ahead, feel, feel, feel free to text me, that's, that's fine. But if you're gonna text me, you gotta tell me who you are. Um, just don't say, hey, I have some questions and that's gonna really creep me out. So, let's see. Um, let me go to the 
talk about the survey. Let me pull this up. Make sure it gets caught up. Okay. I can see that what you're seeing is just a few seconds behind me, but hopefully that will be okay. Uh, give me one second to look at some of these questions that popped up, and, uh, and I'll be right back. Someone asked about the disability. Um, what this is, is you'll see later on in the survey, it is self-identified, okay? So, you know, if somebody tells you they don't have a disability, then you have to mark that they don't have a disability, even though you might think that they do have a disability. So let's start at the beginning. Right here, you're gonna see point in time survey. Person conducting the survey, your volunteer name needs to go here. OK, we need to know your city. And I'm telling you all of this because uh, when you email me and say, hey, Lindsay, all of our surveys are done for this homeless coalition. What I can do is I get to go and I get to pull all of your surveys. So I have just your surveys to work with. Um, and you're going to need to tell me all of the cities that were conducted uh, or where the survey was conducted. So if you leave some cities out, I'm not going to be able to grab them until later when I realize at the end of the process, okay, we've got 15 extra surveys here. I got to find out where they belong. So it's really important that you put that the city down. Now, your facility and your street address, um, it doesn't have to be exact. If you know, you're on a street somewhere and it's at the corner of 12th and Main, just go ahead and put 12th and Main because you know you can't just locate the exact address. Um, if you're at a shelter, go ahead and put what shelter it is. That, that, that's really helpful. That's, that's the best thing to do. Um, got another question here, but just give me one second to get through some of this initial stuff right here. First question you're going to see, we would like the person's initials. Now, this is so we, it's for deduplication process. In case you enter the same survey twice, we can go through there and say, oh, okay, this person has the same initials. Um, same date of birth, same answers, and we can get rid of one of them, okay? So that's really important. We also need their date of birth. Um, this, again, deduplication process. And I know it's going to kind of sound weird to have these boxes right here because we just asked for a person's date of birth, but here's the deal. Sometimes they're not going to give you the year. And we do, HUD wants to know how old these people are, and these are the categories that HUD uh, lays out. This is how we have to report. So please, please, please mark these boxes. It's really essential that we know uh, which particular category they fall into. Now, um, next question, where are you sleeping tonight? There are a lot of possibilities listed here, okay? So what I would suggest is don't read the categories out loud. Just listen to the person when they answer you, okay? Um, you need to go ahead and read all of these ahead of time, again, to be prepared and review the survey. But just listen to what the person says, and chances are it's going to be on this list. Uh, the most uh, common response is obviously emergency shelter, transitional, uh, DV shelter, um, street sidewalk, and then sharing housing of other people. Okay, so that's over here. Uh, somebody asked, should it say, where did you sleep last night? No, it shouldn't. Um, it has in the past and it shouldn't have because the point of the, the count is to find out where people are sleeping on a particular night. And so we want to know where people are sleeping the night of January 21st, 2016. Um, somebody said, is asking if we can check two boxes, a transitional housing program for DV women and children. That would just be DV. Um, so the domestic violence is going to, to override. If, if the place where they're staying is specifically for women and children um, getting away from a domestic violence situation, it's domestic violence. And you're going to notice here that 
this is not worded properly. Are you going to stay in the same place tonight? Well, it needs to say, are you going to stay in the same place tomorrow? And that's why I said, uh, um, that's why I said uh, not to print these off right now, because that that's going to need to be changed and either yes, no. And if they're not want to know where they're going to stay. Um, okay, I'm getting a couple of questions. Give me one second. Let me read these. If a person says they don't know where they're going to be sleeping, yes, definitely inquire about where they were sleeping the previous night. But if they um, if they don't know where they're going to be sleeping, there's a really good chance that it's probably going to be um, on the streets or with somebody. And feel free to ask. And you know. Tell your volunteers that's okay. I really do want to know where they're going to be sleeping tonight or the night of the count. Um, let's see. Um, Michelle, let's talk about this offline because you have a unique situation. So just email me um, after the webinar. That's okay. Okay. So again, like I said, um, and like Eric said earlier, these um, <laughs> were collaborating with someone else and looking at this, as I was looking at this um, later or earlier today, I, I realized that these need to be um, in different places, okay? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna be asking somebody about their current um, situation. So are you currently homeless? And then we want to know how many times, but we also need to know whether or not they're actually homeless. So it's possible that somebody could say, well, I'm not homeless and we need to have a box for that. So there's not one here now. I will put one there. We also want to know how long it's lasted. You know, they're not going to be able, if they've been homeless for a couple of years. They're not going to be able to give you the number of days. Just, just get a roundabout. Okay. Three years. That's great. Or maybe it's been three months or Maybe hopefully it's only been a day. Uh, so that will need to be filled out too. And I think that's really interesting for your local homeless coalitions and your communities to know as well. Uh, another really important thing that I know everybody wants to know is the city, the individual or family, where they were living when they became homeless this time, not you know a couple of years ago, but this time, where were you living when you became homeless? Because I know a lot of people say, oh, well, we get a lot, we get all of these folks from, who knows where they come, they use all of our services, and uh, no, that's generally not the case. So that's a really good question to have too. Um, so like Eric was saying, some of these questions have a youth bent to them, and this is one of them. So at what age did you first face homelessness or not having a permanent home? It's a great question. And then was your first experience being homeless or without a permanent home with your family, or were you on your own? Again, these are gonna be really interesting questions if the, the people that we're talking to are youth. Um, but it's also an interesting question to know um, about our adults as well. So moving on, we would like to know the reasons um, why somebody uh, became homeless or without a permanent place to live. And we have a lot of we have a lot of options here and a lot of these options actually have come from people writing in in previous years right here okay so let's just go over these really quick financial reasons unable to pay rent or mortgage yes this is these are generally the top two right unemployment falls right in there loss of public aid natural disaster unemployment again move to seek work evicted, a physical disability injury or other physical health reasons, domestic violence, family illness, divorce, separation, hospital discharge, pregnant or parenting, a mental illness, substance abuse, left jail, prison or detention center, criminal record, ran away from home, a lifestyle choice, we come across that occasionally, not often, but we do occasionally come across that. Uh, sexual orientation or gender identity to protect yourself from family members. Abandonment by parent or guardian, too crowded. 
aged out of or ran away from foster care, kicked out of the house by family or kicked out of the house by friends. So there are a lot of options there. There's also a box for other if uh, something doesn't fall into that category. Um, but just listen to what they're telling you because it very well might fall into one of these categories, okay? Next, we wanna move on to gender identity. There are four different options here and you do need to, to ask. Um, again, this is kind of where you need to be sensitive and non-judgmental because if somebody doesn't feel safe with you, one, they're gonna stop the survey and so we're gonna lose that data and there, there's a good chance that then they're not gonna go seek the services that they, that they need. So our options here, male, female, transgender male to female, transgender female to male. Uh, so moving on to sexual orientation, this is a new category this year. This is one that we will probably uh, keep for future point in time counts. Um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, straight, questioning, or prefer not to answer. These are pretty straightforward. And race. One thing about this is that we're going to take off, check all that apply because we have a way to uh, only do, we just need one of these checked. So options are the same as they've always been, except here we give the option of two or more, which is a lot easier on the back end when we're running the statistics to check two or more um, here because otherwise we would have to, we have to do some crazy stuff in order to find out who's checked two or more. So those are the options there. Uh, whether or not the person considers themselves to be Hispanic or Latino, yes, no, pretty simple. What I would tell you here is don't make that judgment call for yourself um, or, or yourself. Um, don't just look at somebody's skin color and think that you can, you can make that assumption because you can't. Because if you looked at my skin color, you probably wouldn't expect me to say that, yes, I consider myself a Latina. Moving on uh, to school. Are you enrolled in school right now? Again, like Eric was saying, kind of geared a little bit to youth this year. Yes, no. Um, if they're not in school, want to know if they plan to return. This is uh, the highest level of education. This is not familiar or not uh, unusual to anyone. Um, same options as we've had before less than ninth grade, some high school, GED, high school diploma, some college, college graduate, technical school, or master's degree or higher. While in school, have you ever received special education services for more than six months? Pretty straightforward, yes, no. On the back of the survey, or page two, are you able to work? Yes, no. And then we want to know job status, which this is the same thing as we've always done. And then if somebody says that they're unemployed or they're not working right now, but they're looking for work, we definitely want to know how long they've, they've been unemployed or how long they've been uh, looking for work. So again, just put the number of years, number of months or number of days um, there. And next we go to, have you ever served in the uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard? You can just say, have you ever served in the military? Some people, um, and, and that's a yes or no, but here's the deal. We need you to ask 17B. Even if they say no, we still need you to ask 17B as to whether or not they've been called into active duty as a, as a National Guard or a reservist, because HUD and the VA have found out that sometimes uh, veterans, when they're asked if they've served in the military, they will say no because they don't look at the National Guard being a reservist as part of the military. So we want to go ahead and um, and ask and ask that question. So somebody really quick was asking what happens if somebody asks what special education services consist of? That's a really great question, and I'm going to get an answer for you, and I will definitely let everyone know. I'll just email everybody, okay, um, because I'm not sure of what that is. Again, like Eric was saying, you know, we collaborated with other people on this, and these are the questions that they really needed in here. So I'll, uh, I'll, get, that, I'll get that answer for you. 
So if somebody was a member of the military, we would like to know um, under what tours of duty. So check all that apply. If you come acro across a Korean veteran, that's amazing. We, I think, maybe get one a year. Um, most of your vets will probably uh, be from Vietnam. And I, I think at, at, at last year I was thinking, oh, there's going to be a lot of Afghanistan and Iraqi veterans, but no, it's still Vietnam. Uh, then go ahead, ask the number of years and whether or not they've received any health care or other benefits from, uh, from the VA Medical Center. The next question, have you experienced physical or sexual violence while homeless or without having a permanent home? Now, this is a question I know that might be uncomfortable to ask. I understand that. Um, and I would have to feel really comfortable with somebody in order to provide an honest answer. So again, you can understand why it's really important that we are engaged with the folks that we are talking to um, and, and to make them, make them feel like they can tell their stories to us. So some people are, you're gonna ask that question and some people are gonna laugh at you and say no. Um, and, and some people might get really quiet. Um, don't just assume that that's a yes, but try and talk to them and, and see if, uh, if they are willing to answer. You know what, if they're not willing to answer that question, that is okay. Um, just skip. You don't have to answer it. Next question, are you pregnant or expecting a child? And then have you ever had a child? And then is the child currently with you? We are very, very interested in this particular child. Um, and then if no, we'd like to know where the child is if, there, if it's not with the respondent. The next one we have, uh, this is our how we uh, describe our household type. We have a single individual adult, an unaccompanied minor, so that means that th this person is, is a minor and not living with a parent or a legal guardian. Uh, we have a parent who is part of a two-parent family with children, a part of a couple with no children, a single parent with a child or children, and then a minor living with one or more parents because, again, you know, definitely you might be interviewing somebody who, who is younger and then other type of family. So if their household doesn't fall into this, um, go ahead and try and find out what their household makeup is because it might actually fall into one of these categories. But, you know, if it's um, a 26 year old and their grandmother, then go ahead and type in and mark other type of family. And then the Here's a disability question we were talking about earlier. Uh, do you have any of the following health conditions? So we have alcohol abuse or addiction, other substance abuse, mental illness, physical disability, developmental disability, HIV AIDS, PTSD, or traumatic brain injury. I'm also going to include a box that uh, for none of the above because you know it's really nice just to have for people say, I, I don't have any of that, and then you can mark something down. And then we want to know 22B, uh, if the person has marked something, uh, we would like to know if that particular disability prevents them from keeping a job. And then we want to know which one it is. And here's another question that, uh, that might be a little uncomfortable to ask. And um, again, make, make this person feel uh, comfortable with you because again they're sharing their story and it's not always going to be easy. We want to know if anyone has experienced domestic violence, a child abuse or neglect, if they've been in foster care, any legal problems or a prior conviction, a sexual assault, or any gang involvement. And then we're going to move on to number 24. What, this is basically just what services do you need? And this hasn't changed from previous years. Basic needs uh, like clothing and food, uh, job training or placement, food stamps, transportation assistance, case management, VA benefits, or other. So then we, what, what we want to do is we want to head down to this box here. 
Now, you're going to see in this first column, it is saying relationship to head of household. So if it is the person's uh, husband, we want to put, you know, spouse. We want to know how old this person is. We want to know this person's gender. We want to know their race, whether or not they consider themselves to be Latino. And if it's an adult, their veteran status. And even though it says adults here, you wouldn't believe how many three-year-olds last year were marking no because they were not a veteran. I know that. Um, so disabilities, I'm going to choose all that apply. So these are all things that HUD wants to know. They, they want to know all of these categories for every person living in the household. So what we don't want to do is put the person that you were just talking to who filled out all this other stuff. This is not for them because they already answered all of these questions. This is for the other people who are in their household. So um, that is the, uh, that's the, uh, the survey. So what I'm going to do, if, uh, if anybody has a question that they would like to ask where they don't have to put it in the question box, you have the ability to uh, basically raise your hand and then I can unmute you and you can go ahead and ask to the entire group and then we'll discuss that. So just let me know, or if you don't want to do that and you want to do it in the, uh, in, in the question box, that's fine too. Um, I'm more than happy to answer either way, but I just can't unmute all of you at once because it'll be crazy. Okay, not everybody at once. Okay. Well, yes, great. Um, somebody is asking uh, the final version of the survey. I would say later this afternoon. I just need to take out a couple of uh, things, um, put some boxes in there um, where I've noticed boxes aren't, and. Um, and, and so I'm hoping this afternoon that we'll have the, the final English version available. Um, someone is asking if there is a Spanish version. We have a volunteer who uh, does it for us every year, and um, hopefully she'll be able to, to get that for you as well. So this is, um, again, like I said, it's, she's volunteering to do this on top of her regular job, um, and she's actually on the call right now. So, uh, so yes, we are going to have this... Um, have it available in Spanish. We just uh, don't have the draft of it yet. Um, will you provide the survey tool in PDF? Yes, it's all going to be in PDF for you. Uh, it's in Word right now because, like I said, I still have uh, some edits to make on this. But yeah, it'll be in P PDF when it gets to you. Spanish version as well. Let's see. Okay, so someone's asking, if someone takes the survey, but it turns out they're not homeless, then do we cease the survey at question number two, or is there value in all those other stats from, uh, from those around homelessness but not experiencing it tonight? I would say yes. Um, I would assume that you would want this for, um, uh, for your community um, because if they're not – homeless tonight, but there's somewhere that where other homeless people are, maybe a soup kitchen or something like that, um, there, there's a chance they could be, and they're utilizing services in your community. So I would go ahead and collect that data. I don't see anything wrong with that because we're not giving it to HUD. So HUD won't see that, and it's not somebody won't accidentally be counted. Um, it's really up to you, but I, I think it's worth it. I think it's really worth gathering all of this information. And let's see. Um, we can ask about if they have applied. Okay, somebody is asking, can a box be added to ask about if they have applied for SSI, SSD in conjunction with 22A? Let me take a look at 22A. 
Um, Kim, let's talk offline because you're using a different survey and um, you actually you actually have that question on, on, on the survey that you're going to be using. So we'll, we'll talk offline about that. Uh, somebody is asking, will healthcare services not be asked about on this year's point in time like it has been in previous years where they uh, received care or if they needed care? That's correct. Um, it's not going to be on this on this survey. Again, this is kind of a, a, a one-time deal that we're doing it this way. Like Eric explained at the beginning of, of our call, if there's a, consen a consensus, we can definitely bring that back for next year. Um, I know some people like it, some people think it's a big headache, um, but yeah, it's not going to be on this year's survey. Okay. I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and end this. I will stay on here for a couple of more minutes if anybody um, wants to stick around or you realize, oh, I have another question, go ahead. Otherwise, you all have my email address. You have my cell phone number and my office number, so do not hesitate to contact me. Um, I, love, I love when people contact me and ask questions um, because it means you care and uh, your data is going to be good because uh, you're trying to get to the marrow of this and, and that's fantastic. So um, thank you all so much for going through this. I know it can be pretty tedious um, and not at all boring. So I thank you very much. Uh, I know we're all busy. So um, we'll end this and uh, have a happy Thanksgiving next week.